Hi, I'm Reggie Ray, and I'd like to talk to you about my master's essay. The big idea is that automation technology in the 2010s has reached a critical threshold. Previously throughout human history, technology development created about as many jobs as it destroyed. This time, however, looks different. In part because these new jobs are likely suited to very few people, and in part because governments are no longer as well equipped as they once were to respond to innovation. The likely result is that developed countries, for which I use the shorthand G7 countries in my essay, will undergo a tumultuous and painful transition as automation technology is widely adopted. The second half of my essay concerns strategies that can be used by enterprising millennials to respond to such a labor landscape. Quickly, I'd like to review the history of technological unemployment in the labor landscape. This isn't so much an academic exercise as a practical one. Human history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And those rhymes may tell us something meaningful about our present circumstance. Plato was among the first men whose anxieties surrounding innovation were recorded. He famously lamented way back in the 4th century, before it was cool, that technology was destroying the youth. By technology, he meant styluses. That's right, Plato was under the impression that writing implements would make it pointless to memorize information and hence consign humankind to a future of imbecility. Next comes the Roman Emperor Vespasian, who reigned shortly after the death of Christ from 69 to 79. A great builder as well as a general, Vespasian began construction of the Colosseum as well as other massive public works. When a Roman inventor proposed a device that would make it more efficient and cheap to transport the heavy goods required, Vespasian intervened, saying, You must allow my poor haulers to earn their bread, and thusly outlawed the device. His caution is not necessarily comparable to that of leaders today, as those haulers, had they lost their livelihoods, might well have risen up in bloody rebellion, killing Vespasian. Ah, the printing press. Invented in the year 1440 by Johannes Geinsflech zur Laden zum Gutenberg, a humble printer and blacksmith in the Holy Roman Empire, the printing press was immediately controversial. Scribes, stationers, and scholars worried that the press would put them out of a job. Their fears were well-founded. The printing press spread like wildfire, and just 60 years later, at the turn of the century, was commonplace across Europe. Of course, it was not all bad, the printing press enabled faster communication, promoted literacy, and underpinned the rapid development of the Renaissance. Queen Elizabeth I of England was another technology skeptic and actively denied a patent application for automating textile sewing. Indeed, she went so far as to write the inventor himself, saying, Consider thou what the invention could do to my poor subjects. It would assuredly bring them to ruin by depriving them of employment, thus making them beggars. In a fascinating twist of fate, that very knitting machine was commercialized, about 200 years after Queen Elizabeth's death. Her concern proved prescient, however, as the machine led to mass layoffs and social unrest. Indeed, in 1811, the Luddite uprising rocked the United Kingdom, leading to many destroyed machines and many deaths, as mill owners massacred their protesting ex-employees. The Industrial Revolution was, by 1811, in full swing in England and gaining momentum across the continent. The revolution was marked by immense changes in the way machines were made and operated and goods were produced. It was heralded as well by the advent of transnational rail lines, enabling the movement of people and products on a theretofore unprecedented scale. In sum, the Industrial Revolution precipitated immense social change. Towns quickly went bust or boomed based on their industrial output. Living conditions were one of the casualties of this revolution, sadly, as a new class of industrial worker emerged, choked by the smoke of their factory and oppressed by an often brutal managerial class. One of the first responses to the Industrial Revolution came in the form of a coordinated campaign by social reformers, artists, designers, architects, and other creative professionals. Their movement came to be known as arts and crafts. The term is hardly adequate, though, as the movement advocated change, not just in style, but in how goods were produced. Arts and crafts proponents such as John Ruskin and William Morris encouraged designers to embrace materials. 
traditional manufacturing processes, and a humane work-life balance. Their campaign was greeted enthusiastically in England, which bore the brunt of industrialization's early miscontents, and later in Europe, North America, and even Japan. The arts and crafts movement catalyzed a distinctive aesthetic, one which is still sought after today, if a Google search for stickly chair is any clue. And, if it weren't already clear, I'm a major fan of the products that emerged from the movement, as well as the ideas which heavily influenced my five business model proposals. Leaping forward through time, we come to the famed British economist and liberal darling John Maynard Keynes. Keynes was a highly original thinker and the father of many influential theories, including those concerning labor and employment. With respect to the latter, he opined that equilibrium employment rates would remain constant over time, regardless of technological innovation. The more jobs we lost to technology, in other words, the more jobs would be created by the same. This notion he termed technological unemployment, and it forms the basis of my essay, the fundamental question of which is whether technological unemployment post-AI will permanently disrupt employment equilibrium. The Works Progress Administration, or WPA, is seen today in cornerstone form on buildings across America. Sadly, it's little understood and seldom discussed. I say sadly because the program, which kicked off in 1935, had an immense impact on recession-ravaged Americans, eight and a half million of whom ended up working for and drawing a paycheck from the agency. The WPA can take credit for a great amount of the built environment in the USA, ranging from 5,900 schools to 1,000 libraries to 2,300 stadiums, not to mention the Cathedral of Learning in my own neighborhood post office. The Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC, was a similar Roosevelt agency, though this one was targeted at young, impoverished males. In my essay, I discuss the advisability of reviving programs like the WPA and CCC, which were more cost-effective than welfare handouts, and moreover affected a major improvement in the self-esteem of their participants. The 1960s saw another round of automation mania, along with automation anxiety and hysteria. Times Magazine wrote a cover story about it. Newspapers penned frantic updates about the layoffs resulting from the latest rounds of automation adoption. The Computer Numerical Controlled Mill, or CNC, spun out of MIT began to take off in the 60s as computing power began to plunge in price. By 1966, automation mania had even reached the White House. President Johnson, terrified at the prospect of mass layoffs, impaneled a Blue Ribbon National Commission on Technology, Automation, and Economic Progress to study the issue head-on. LBJ's experts were less than convinced by the threat, however, and largely sided with Keynes's earlier analysis in their report. Rather concisely, they noted that technology eliminates jobs, not work. A new specter began to take shape in the 60s, this time in university labs. It went by the term artificial intelligence. Progress was rapid, and by the mid-80s, nearly all current techniques in AI were settled. There remained only one major problem, computing power. But by the first decade of the current millennium, that began to change, and with it, the status of AI. Old algorithms were dusted off, given new life with 7th generation Intel chips, and roared back into vogue. Machine learning and related tools under the aegis of AI are indeed hot. And the question top of mind today is whether these techniques are powerful enough to buck the trend of employment equilibrium. In my report, I express doubt that even AI, as human obsolescing as it may be, is capable of disrupting this equilibrium. There is a major caveat, though. Institutions, from the state to the private sector, must be able to adapt in response to the new labor landscape wrought by AI. And to date, there's little evidence of such ability. The smart money is on Keynes being proven wrong at last. The last item I'd like to cover is the entrepreneurial strategies I lay out at the end of my report. Basically, a way to deal with this eventuality. The rise of AI and the inability of government to keep up. Unfortunately, none of my ideas is a panacea. None will change the game by itself. But they may well provide a livelihood and, if not more important, an existential satisfaction to those who find themselves jobless in the wake of AI. Namely, 
and I propose artisanal production, mass production, riding the blockchain, rook training initiatives, and smallholder farming. Now, if those terms sound bewildering, fear not. Google midterm effects of AI on G7 labor markets to read a synopsis of my report, including a detailed discussion of these strategies.